Okay, so hello everyone, and thank you for joining us at today's webinar, a first look at native AI capabilities in content.ai. I'm very excited that you're all here today with us, and you get to see these exciting new capabilities in our product. So I'm joined today by Thomas Ruby. He's the lead product manager at content.ai. I'm Jordan Torpy. I'm a product marketing manager at content.ai. Today, we'll be talking about the state of the market. We'll take a quick look at our product vision. Then Thomas will walk us through a product showcase. We'll talk about our timeline for AI capabilities in our product, and we'll have some time for a Q&A at the end. But before we get started, I think we can kick things off with a quick little poll. Uh, how many of you are currently using AI for your daily work? So you can answer if you're already using it, if you're not yet using it, or if you are not using it and you don't plan to use it in the future. Um, and we can take a look at the results of that poll at the end of the webinar. So let's just give everyone a minute to fill that out. Got some results coming in, that's great. Okay, so let's start by talking about what the digital experience market looks like today. Uh, we all know that last fall, OpenAI released ChatGPT, and that sort of opened the floodgates for a new gold rush in the digital experience market with people trying to figure out how to incorporate AI capabilities into their product. People are adjusting their roadmap. We're seeing lots of new announcements from CMS companies and other digital experience companies. Uh, we're seeing lots of different approaches, and I'm curious, Thomas, if you can share you know, some of what you've been seeing in the market so far. Yeah, right. Uh, we see almost every CMS vendor jumping on the AI wagon. And uh, what we believe and think that uh, although it might be simple and fast and straightforward to integrate ChatGPT or different uh, AI model into your CMS, uh, uh, there are complexities and perhaps hidden nuances that can uh, make the difference between uh, just repurposing the technology and uh, its optimal utilization. Um, and we think it manifests in uh, these three critical areas uh, where, in my opinion, uh, content creators might hit a serious obstacle when trying to interact directly with the language model. So the first is about prompt design or prompt creation. And I bet uh, all of you who have already tried playing with ChatGPT or trying it for production um, content creation that uh, you will agree that it's not that simple to create a prompt that will get uh, exactly the job you need done uh, because you need to spend minutes or uh, 15 or more minutes uh, refining the prompt to get uh, uh, actual results so prompt design is more becoming a separate skill or an art because moreover uh, what was for example not, not very effective in GPT 3.5 is very much effective in GPT 4. So with every major model update, you will need to revisit uh, and uh, your uh, internal prompt design uh, library and skills. And this would force the content creators to become prompt designers themselves, which uh, in turn would uh, cost them a significant amount of time. But I'm curious, uh, Jordan, what do you think about uh, prompt design uh, from your experience as a content creator yourself? Yeah, I mean, of course, I was very excited when ChatGPT was first released, and I've spent a lot of time playing around with it. Um, and I've had some some great results, but often it takes a lot of work on, on my side creating a good prompt. Um, maybe I need to go looking for good prompts that other people have used, or I need to try to you know, play around with the prompt that I'm using to get the results that I want. In the end, I end up spending a lot of time fiddling with the prompt, trying to find a, a prompt that worked before in the past, and less time actually getting good output. So when it comes time for me to do serious work, I often forego using anything like ChatGPT and just using you know, the tool set that I had available to me before. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, what we've been hearing uh, throughout our interviews too. Um, so this is just the first point. The second point is about context, and uh, it's nothing uh, new that uh, the output of the AI is just as good as the context to feed it. But the important thing to realize is that sometimes context is uh, very challenging to get because it's scattered across different roles within the marketing teams, different tools, and even within a single CMS platform, it's in uh, different uh, places kind of all over the place. And extracting and curating uh, this context and transforming it into something usable in the prompt uh, is Again, time consuming and energy draining. Uh, what do you think about uh, that? What has been a critical piece of information for you, Jordan, that uh, wasn't easily accessible uh, for ChatGPT? 
Yeah, I mean, again, this is a, a case of where ChatGPT is just hard to use uh, for my day-to-day -day work. So the content that we create has a specific tone of voice, uh, different brand guidelines that we use. Uh, we create content for different audiences, and so we have to tailor the content that we create to those audiences that are defined somewhere, you know, within our own internal documentation. Um, if I want to have ChatGPT create that content, I need to share those guidelines with it in a prompt, um, and that's not necessarily safe to do on the, in, in the first place, um, but also it's kind of tedious. Um, so, yeah, it's it's these these AI models um, don't have the context they need to do the work that I need to get done right now. Yeah, and sometimes uh, regular content creators don't even have uh, uh, the knowledge of where to find all the required guidelines. Uh, so uh, definitely, definitely there is room for making it uh, a bit easier. Um, but uh, these two things uh, were just the basic stuff. Uh, uh, now, uh, what we call composing AI is about achieving complex tasks with uh, with AI skills, and because AI skills are just uh, like human brain, AI, specific AI models or specific AI prompts are like uh, specific uh, brain centers. But uh, for complex tasks, having um, prefrontal cortex or some kind of orchestration in uh, the language of AI models is essential because one AI model might be um, effective uh, for content generation or brainstorming, the other for categorization and uh, determining terminology, taxonomy, and uh, the other for multimedia, for example. Uh, but uh, the same um, as uh, prefrontal cortex is a huge energy consumer, AI orchestration is also a pretty time consuming and a complex task. And basically doing this orchestration composing yourself or manually makes the same amount of sense as building the front end application manually. Uh, so uh, really we are talking about time consuming complexity that's uh, by nature, I would say a programmatic task. So uh, these are the three key points, but if we if uh, these weren't enough, there is always the challenge of integration. First, it's about maintenance. Uh, either uh, the customer need to maintain the integration community or uh, the vendor. And if it's the vendor, then uh, that's uh, the better alternative. But there still are other issues like uh, increased uh, attack surface because there is yet another API key that can leak that you need to manage. And in terms of user experience, uh, the integration, uh, paradoxically, the experience of integration will not be uh, as integrated uh, and fluent as uh, natively in an as native functionality. So uh, integrations uh, bring a trade-off that simply can't be ignored. Um, so uh, we mentioned uh, three plus one uh, issues and uh, we believe that uh, uh, there is a huge gap for innovation, for finding a solution that repurposes these powerful AI skills, but at the same time, that's optimized for content creation use cases. Yeah, so then, Thomas, maybe it's a great time for us to introduce our vision for AI in a headless CMS. You can talk a little bit about what that might look like. Sure, happy to do that. Uh, our vision is revolved around uh, two major uh, product principles or pillars. Uh, the first pillar is uh, integrated uh, experience and the second pillar is uh, uh, accurate uh, suggestions. So let's talk about each of them in a bit more detail. So integrated experience. So what we mean by that is really native and fluent experience throughout the whole journey. And uh, the devil is really in the details here, because uh, imagine uh, when, for example, working in a rich text, uh, when asking AI to review an article that has uh, already formatting like bold bullet points or tables or entities like linked content or assets uh, within it. Uh, typically, when using GPT for that, you end up uh, with uh, either malformed formatting or uh, plain text, and you need to redo the whole enrichment uh, yourself again and again. Uh, with uh, natively integrating AI, uh, we are able to 
to uh, make sure that uh, the AI respects and keeps the formatting so that you can fluently continue with uh, your task after getting the suggestion. Well, the next subtle detail is about the availability of uh, the experience. For example, um, content creators uh, would find uh, the AI skills right uh, where uh, they expect them. Right? But uh, the possibilities here are really endless because uh, we already were brainstorming improvements for the future, like uh, we can set up a content type to automatically populate elements like um, uh, summary or title. Um, and this experience will be very difficult to achieve if uh, the AI weren't that close to the CMS core as uh, it is uh, in our solution. Uh, so the next pillar is about uh, accurate uh, suggestions. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the context is important and is kind of scattered all over the place. But uh, if you realize uh, uh, what amount of context already is within the different places in the CMS, guidelines, content type definitions, existing content and assets, uh, taxonomies. Well, uh, those are the things that first uh, uh, would be nice to utilize, but also that enterprises might feel a bit uncomfortable sharing with a third party. But with the native uh, functionality, it's a completely different and much safer story. Uh, but, uh, well, so far we are leveraging existing content for driving context, uh, and we are already seeing uh, very impressive results. But uh, based on all the things I have enumerated for different uh, sources of context, you can imagine that uh, with the native solution, we are able to find exactly the right pieces that make a difference for different uh, use cases and making um, the quality of the suggestions higher. Um, so, uh, another two factors in uh, improving the accuracy are uh, depicted on this slide. Uh, um, the, the next one is about uh, prompt design. As I mentioned, prompt design is not as straightforward. And uh, when I say that, I actually speak from uh, my and from our experience because we spent days uh, refining and trying and failing and finding in the end uh, the effective prompts and uh, what actually seems like a, a simple prompt like make content shorter or changing the tone of voice is a pretty long and pretty complex prompt in the background that makes sure that uh, all the things like formatting are kept or the limitations are respected etc uh, or that uh, the ai doesn't hallucinate uh, etc um well uh, and uh, we believe that uh, by curating these predefined prompts for you, we save uh, hours of uh, doing research compared to when you um, design your prompts than, than yourself. So really that's an experience designed for the content creators, not uh, prompt designers. Another factor is uh, um, when I was mentioning these uh, complex pipelines, the prefrontal cortex orchestrating uh, different uh, different specialized AI skills or the brain centers. Um, imagine a use case like uh, generating paragraphs from uh, uh, your notes or bullet points uh, or whatever format you have uh, uh, the draft in. Uh, what sounds like a straightforward AI skill actually uh, might contain multiple steps. The first prompt uh, might uh, determine the uh, category category of uh, uh, the content you are about to write uh, based on the taxonomy that you have in the product uh, in your project. The second prompt uh, might uh, use the taxonomy to find and extract the stylistic information from context content in the same category, and the third prompt might uh, use uh, this context to generate the actual content, and uh, the fourth prompt might suggest existing assets from your existing asset library that might be fitting for this category or uh, in, in uh, for the content that you are writing. So what we are talking about here is really a hidden uh, sophistication that uh, makes the AI skills more powerful. And so these were the two pillars that uh, we believe that uh, will bridge the gap um, uh, between uh, uh, only repurposing uh, the AI technology but, and uh, optimizing it for content creation use cases, and that will um, 
also uh, improve uh, the challenges, uh, the three challenges that uh, we mentioned uh, before. So that's it about uh, the vision. Yeah, thank you, Thomas, for sharing. It's It's been uh, really exciting to watch this vision kind of come to life and and be actualized. And it's, you know, I think it's going to be very empowering for content creators and content teams. So maybe we can just take a second to recap on uh, what's what's unique about our approach to these AI capabilities in our product. Uh, the, the first key point is that we're offering a native solution, not a plugin. And so I think that will really make a difference for content creators and help them work more efficiently and more effectively with these AI capabilities as part of their toolkit. For organizations, I think it's very interesting that our approach is GDPR compliant, and that's because we're powered by Azure services. Um, another interesting thing for larger organizations is that the data and content that they use in content at AI is secure, and it won't be used to train further AI models, which I think is an important sticking point for some organizations. Uh, and then again, for content creators, I think what's really exciting is that these AI capabilities are aware of context. They're aware of the content that's in your project, they're aware of your content models and taxonomies, and that just allows us to have far more powerful AI capabilities within our platform. But we've done a lot of talking about our vision, uh, what we think sets us apart. I think it's time that we actually see these AI capabilities in the product. Uh, so Thomas, would you be able to walk us through that? Yeah, let's do it. So uh, uh, I have an article that um, I created and a po a post uh, that I pushed for review and uh, it came up with a couple of uh, comments. And uh, what I'm actually looking at is uh, at least a half an hour, perhaps uh, an hour of refining the content. So let's see how AI can help me with this. So uh, uh, the first uh, comment is about uh, the fourth section, which is uh, really complicated uh, regarding language and it's kind of uh, also too long. So what I can do is uh, I can select the text and ask the AI to simplify the language in this case. Um, and then uh, perhaps I can ask it uh, uh, to uh, shorten it. So I will, I will re replace the suggestion, which uses a bit simpler language, but I can also ask the AI to make it a bit shorter than um, the original to not uh, bloat the article. So yeah, this uh, works well. Um, let's move on to the next comment, which uh, address which uh, talks about uh, not mentioning the data points, but rather uh, putting it into a fluent text paragraph. So again, I will select uh, the data points, the bullet points, and I will generate paragraph idle out of that. And uh, really, I. Uh, can uh, here try different, try again to see different angles and point of views of uh, uh, how this uh, paragraph can be written. Uh, so I can I can again replace this, uh, but uh, it's uh, uh, far too long, so I can try to make it shorter. Uh, I can try to make it shorter, and this this looks fine. Uh, so. Uh, the next paragraph, uh, uh, the next uh, the next comment is about uh, the tone of voice. The first uh, uh, section can really um, harm our brand's reputation because uh, it's written in a humorous, even sarcastic tone of voice. Uh, and our brand guidelines say uh, that uh, uh, we want to be instructive uh, and uh, professional. So what I can do that I can ask the AI to improve writing in this case, and I have two options. I can um, inject the context uh, about our tone of voice in our brand guidelines via a content brief, or I can use some existing content to kind of uh, act as a sample uh, when it comes to these properties. So in this case, it's simple for me to use existing content. And what I will do, I will select already approved articles and these approved articles are going to be used to uh, do the sophisticated uh, uh, compost uh, more uh, pipeline of different AI skills because under the hood, the first skill is going to extract the tone of voice and stylistic information from the approved article and the second one is going to be used to uh, generate the alternative content. So yeah, uh, the alternative is actually much more professional. It's not humorous and sarcastic at all. So let me uh, use it and resolve the comment. Uh, now, before I publish this article, there are still two 
elements to complete. Uh, so I need to generate a teaser and a title. So what I can do is I can select the whole body text and uh, with the help of AI generate uh, some catching or, or neat summary. I can again try again uh, to see some alternatives and I'm going to copy to clipboard and uh, insert it in, as the teaser and the same way I'm going to use the AI to uh, generate title for it. So I'm going to fill it and now I can either submit the article for second round of review or I can uh, publish it uh, uh, if I have uh, the rights to do so. So what uh, you're uh, looking at here is uh, me doing what uh, I was expecting to do in a, more than half an hour, doing in a couple of minutes uh, with the help of uh, the integrated uh, AI assistant. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, back to you, Jordan. Yeah, really great, Thomas. Thanks for sharing. I especially liked uh, how you can improve writing based on an existing content sample. That's uh, really impressive to me. So I'm sure the question on everyone's mind is, uh, how do we get our hands on this? Uh, it's, it's a great question. So currently AI capabilities and content at AI are available via a limited early access program. So we wanna work with some of our closest enterprise customers to polish and refine these capabilities to make them as valuable as possible for our customers. Uh, but these capabilities are currently ready for early adopters. So for people who are part of this early access program, they can use these capabilities in their project and they'll work for them. Um, if you want access to the early access program, we encourage you to join our waitlist, and we'll be sharing links for that with everyone who's on this webinar. So I hope you're all very excited about this. Uh, thanks, Thomas, for taking the time to walk us through the product and talk about our vision. And I believe we have some time to open up the floor for some questions. So let's go ahead and do that. Thank you, Jordan. Okay, so it looks like we have some questions already. Uh, Thomas, are you ready to, to take on some of these? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, there was an interesting question about uh, what is the future uh, of AI in content AI, and yeah, actually, it's a as for the uh, uh, so so far in the future is very difficult to answer. But uh, uh, the skills that uh, you've seen now uh, are tied only to content creation, but we believe uh, that uh, AI can help in different. Uh, areas in the end, whole enterprise journey, things like navigation, um, evaluation, or, uh, well, yeah, all, 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 or, or media um, management, etc. cetera. Uh, and in all the steps uh, of the enterprise journey, we want to achieve two things. Uh, the first is to reduce time and resources, but the second and most important is to um, reduce unnecessary review loops and uh, I would say unnecessary human interaction. So that uh, I don't mean that people shouldn't uh, communicate and collaborate on creative tasks, but uh, uh, to make use of the time for really creative stuff and uh, not have to communicate excessively. And the second uh, area we see for the future is uh, how uh, using natural language can help uh, I would say even technical, but uh, mostly non-technical people achieve tedious uh, tasks such as uh, mass migrations or rebrands or uh, mass changes in the content without the developer's help because the AI is able to uh, understand uh, the task, uh, understand the project and uh, uh, perform th the task uh, uh, if instructed to do so. So uh, that I would summarize as uh, like, the further outlooks for, for this functionality. Sure. I think there's a related question I'm seeing come up a bit, and that's around uh, translation. Let me see if I can find this. Uh, yeah. So uh, definitely we see, uh, we identified it as uh, one of the opportunities. Uh, but so far, we are not sure about uh, the quality of the translation compared to the standard translation pipelines and translation services uh, that our enterprise customers are using. That's why uh, so far we are hesitant about the return on investment uh, regarding this job. But uh, 
The purpose of early access uh, is also to fine tune and find the uh, true return of investment uh, uh, job or AI skill. So uh, we'll see. So far, uh, we are we are a bit hesitant about this. Sure. Um, another question about the the future vision here. Um, this is an interesting one. Uh, could the AI be used to help select an asset for us? Uh, yeah, it could definitely one one of uh, so we, we were already thinking like uh, how AI could help uh, keep uh, not only the asset library but also the content inventory uh, organized uh, so that uh, because people often forget uh, to categorize assets to categorize uh, content and uh, uh, when you have this metadata and basically you know which categories asset belongs to and then you know how the asset is used in which category of content is you are used which categories of assets then you can uh, use uh, the categorization language model and uh, like more complex integrated pipeline to suggest uh, the assets that uh, are typically used or the folders that are typically used with this type of content in this sure. category so it's a yeah it's a one, one of the ideas but uh, uh, there are so many possibilities that uh, we really need to prioritize uh, uh, strictly sure sure um we have a question here what AI is what ai service are we integrating with is it chat gpt is it something different is it multiple things yeah that's that's a good question well uh, we have a pretty good strategic partnership with Microsoft. So we are leveraging the uh, Microsoft stack. Uh, uh, basically, the the um, AI services, whether it's open AI service for this advanced uh, large language model, either it's GPT 3.5 or 4, uh, then the cognitive services uh, for uh, having skills on multimedia and stuff. And uh, uh, we are also leveraging a new thing that's, uh, that's called um, um, semantic kernel that, that allows you to, to compose more complex uh, pipelines. Uh, so basically under the hood, uh, yeah, uh, different language models. Currently, mostly for most, most AI skills, we are using uh, GPT-4. Yeah, maybe a related question. Um... Are we feeding all the content to open AI? Um, are, are we are we using this content to train further language models? Yeah, uh, perhaps uh, you you already mentioned Jordan. Yes. Uh, so we are not. Want to pick up this one. <laughs> yeah. So no, we are not. Um, we're using Azure AI services, and they are not using any of the content that you you use to train further language models. Um, there was a, a similar question here, which maybe we can talk about, and that is um, let's let's put this up here. So we're saying the content won't be used to train the AI. How is that achieved when you're using proprietary content to generate tone of, tone of voice, for example? Um, do you want to speak to that at all, Thomas? Or uh, yeah, of course. So as I, uh, it's uh, uh, addressed uh, because the, we thought that uh, we thought about different ways how to improve uh, the. Um, accuracy or quality of the output and of course one of the ways is uh, fine tune or uh, retrain uh, the the model itself first of all the fine tuning uh, we are able to do that per customer well basically um, well every customer could have uh, their their separate uh, model deployment but uh, in this particular case we are using a pipeline of requests or prompts the first prompt is going to extract uh, uh, what's the tone of voice and other stylistic uh, properties uh, are used in the selected content and creates a uh, context for the next prompt that will uh, create content based on that, these gu guidelines. So like first step extracts the guidelines from existing content and the second step uh, creates the content. So uh, the AI doesn't have, uh, doesn't learn or didn't learn on uh, specific examples from, from your projects because like, uh, in uh, Azure uh, AI services, in the OpenAI service, everything is uh, only in the context of prompt. Uh, so after the prompt ends, uh, it doesn't uh, learn or save uh, um, the the, the uh, question and answer any anyway. Yeah. 
um, is a very important question. And that is, have companies already been selected for early access? Is that opening up soon? Uh, if so, what is the target date? So, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so that's, ex that's actually a good question. You can sign up uh, uh, to early access uh, via the uh, button below. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we have a few candidates, but uh, well, the seats, uh, the, the early access is exclusive. The seats are limited and uh, the way we will uh, we will need to select uh, uh, which customers will get into into their early access. But please select. Please try to promote your use case. Basically, what we are interested in is uh, uh, the biggest ROI for for the use case. So uh, that's the only uh, thing I can say. And the wait list is already live. So um, the early access. Uh, uh so uh, but I, I think if uh, we get in touch we can get uh, up and run we can get you up and running and if you get selected we can get you up and running uh, for example in in two weeks yeah i think that's great um, we have quite a few more let's see what we can get to now i think you demoed this one but maybe we can just give a little more clarity on this so how wide is the context that your built-in ai function will use is it just a single document? Is it your whole content AI project? Is it something in between? Mm -hmm. So yeah, right now there are two options. Either you have your internal guidelines and you can paste uh, the text uh, or you select uh, one item that will be as uh, act, that will act as a sample item, but uh, broadening that to multiple items, uh, that uh, would be an easy step forward uh no promises but it wouldn't be that difficult <laughs> but when it comes to learning from the whole project there is uh it's a bit tricky because even in the same project you can talk uh, towards different audiences uh for towards different personas and uh, you need to specify for example which collection to use which taxonomy term to use uh or naming convention you name it so uh, um create or learning or having the AI uh, learn on the whole project might yield uh, inaccurate results, um, paradoxically. Mm -hmm. There's a related question here that I think you you answered here, which is, can we add additional context um, to, to a question like rewrite this without using a specific word? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, you, can, you, can, you can do that. Uh, uh, first by injecting the manual, manual guidelines or by writing custom prompt. But yeah, the custom prompt, it's more like advanced stuff. It's it's good when it's there, but uh, I wouldn't wanna use it um, every time I, I need to help uh, from, from AI, so. Mm -hmm. uh, here's, here's an important question. Um, what's the pricing for this feature? And will it be bound to usage quotas or something else? Mm -hmm. Will I pick up this one, Jordan? Yes, so I can say that we're we're currently working on a pricing model for this. We know it will be available for enterprise customers, but we're looking to find the way to provide the most value to our enterprise customers, um, both in terms of the features we offer, but also in terms of the pricing level and, and how it's priced. So we don't have the price set now, um, but we will certainly let you know once it's available. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of interest in translation. I think that's, a, that's an exciting use case for a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, by the way, we will go through all the questions, but uh, unfortunately, we might not uh, have time to answer answer all of them on, on on the webinar. Yeah, maybe one one last question we can talk about is when when do you think this will be generally available um, out of the early access? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, as we mentioned, we aim uh, later for later this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and okay. uh, then uh, perhaps. Uh, uh there is uh, one more question i will try to highlight it or uh, how, how do you do that about uh, um if uh, the, the participants can can share uh this webinar with their colleagues so yes. there is going to be a recording yes so absolutely you can definitely share this uh, we will share the recording with everyone who attended we'll have it on our website as well um, anyone who wants to watch it is more than welcome to watch it, and we're, we're happy to share it with you. Um, we're also happy to answer more questions, um, although we will have to do it uh, probably asynchronously. Yeah. So I really want to thank everyone for attending today. I think it was, it was great. Thomas, thank you for your demo. Um, I really enjoyed seeing that, and 
thank you for all your time. Thank you for having me. And thank you everyone for your attention. Great. Okay. So I hope everyone's excited and see you all soon. Bye.